conservative new media viewers, Jeremy Lin fans around the world, L.A. Lakers fans around the world. What is up? It's me, PFE, Paul F. Villarreal, the NBA expert, and we are here to discuss in the long video format the Wizards 111-95 victory last night over the Los Angeles Lakers and Jeremy Lin. Uh, I'm sorry I'm making this late. I didn't think I was going to make it, but Alex and a couple other people asked me to make it, and I had the time to do it, so I'm going to do it now. And, uh, of course, we try to do this as often as we can, two videos for each game, and we've accomplished that for most of the games this year. There will be times when I can't do it, whether it's I'm going to visit my family on Christmas or I'm extremely frustrated with a particular game or Jeremy doesn't play much or doesn't do much, so there's not a lot to talk about, etc. In those instances, except for Christmas, I would usually just make one video instead of making two. And almost always in those circumstances, I will make a long video rather than a short video for the one single video. However, last night I just made a short video. Um, and that was, again, that was the exception. That's that's the only time that's happened this year where I made one video and it was just a short video. So this is probably best to do the long video. Now, Jeremy struggled minorly in this game. He did. It was frustrating to me. It was frustrating to a lot of Jeremy's fans. I'm sure it was frustrating for Lakers fans. But what really got to me personally was all of the talk before the game. All of the nonsense, silliness, Jeremy Lin dissing leading up to the Wizards game. And so I was not happy on Twitter. I was not happy in the short video. Now I'm a lot calmer today, but that everything came together last night. And it was extremely frustrating to watch. In terms of how Jeremy played, I have no problem with how he played except for the turnovers. Missing shots is nothing. That happens to everybody that's ever played basketball, no matter how good of a shooter you are. You will have nights where you don't shoot well. Jeremy shot extremely well this year. Career highs in all categories, I believe. This is nothing. He'll get beyond that. The turnover issue was, I thought he was rushing and pressing. And he's had, an, he's had that matter come up for him before. And I, I believe he will overcome it. And I can't wait until he does overcome it. And um, it's unfortunate that he performed in such a way that these dissing narratives of him looked correct last night. So again, that that's a lot of what fed my frustration. Now, before I talk more about the game itself, let me go over some of this, what was being said before the game. I'll give you a kind of a, a, a feel for what it was that was irking me the way that it was. Okay, first of all, Ramona Shelbourne, who is, I don't know exactly what her job is currently with ESPN. She used to be a Lakers beat reporter, their lead beat reporter, essentially. She's very good. I like her work. She has close connections with the Lakers front office. So she is somebody who, if she says something about the Lakers, you, you need to pay attention to it because she usually knows what she's talking about and is hearing it from those sources. She has been filling in for John Ireland this week on the Mason and Ireland ESPN LA radio program. So she's had a lot more time to talk Lakers and, and everything else. 
So somebody directed to me, it was uh, Bebe Sole Mexico on Twitter, Eddie, that Shelbourne had said different things about Lynn. Like, he, he was playing too uptight. He was thinking too much. He really hasn't been that good. Somebody else said that, that Shelbourne said about Lynn that he was a quote-unquote placeholder, meaning he's just a guy there right now, and when somebody better comes along, then Jeremy won't be there, or he won't be the starter, or whatever. Um, also, another person, I guess on the same radio station, I believe it was A. Martinez, said on the previous game or one of the recent games that Lynn wasn't getting it done as a point guard, etc. And Steve Mason himself went on with Ramona Shelbourne said that Lynn wasn't who he thought he was going to be, meaning that he wasn't as good as they thought, and so on and so forth. Now, there was some discussion that changes might be made to the lineup by Byron Scott. And there was some feeling that it might take place during this road trip. Now, that hasn't happened yet, of course, but there was speculation from people like Mark Medina, and I think it's correct that Jeremy might be part of that lineup changing. So these were, there was a lot of this talk going around, and all of this began after the Minnesota game. The Minnesota game was the low point of the season. Lakers were at home. They didn't win. And after that game, both Byron Scott and Kobe were talking about boneheaded plays, maybe poor decisions, etc. And some of that certainly seemed to be around Jeremy. So this was this was the and that was um That was three games ago, I believe. They Then they beat Toronto, they beat Detroit, and then they went in to play Washington. Now, my feeling about the whole thing is that if you continue to win, then Byron Scott is unlikely to make changes. But, again, we last night they didn't win. Jeremy didn't look great. And after the game... More trolls and Lynn doubters were gleefully spreading the message around, and he's not that good. And Adrian Wojnarowski was, I guess he was on a radio station this morning saying that Lynn looks like a one-year player for the Lakers and yada, yada, yada. Coming, Jeremy's had probably his best year so far through this point, or at least until last night. He's been very consistent overall. I think he's improving in different aspects of his game. So the the conversation didn't make a ton of sense to me because I think people are still looking at, at Jeremy through a narrative lens that has changed, but they're not acknowledging the changes. Now, that might... It might still be the case that Jeremy, in his current level as a player, might not fit in Byron Scott's offensive system the way that Byron wants or the way that Kobe wants. And I, I accept that. That's, that could be true. Byron has said that Jeremy still needs to work on his point guard instincts. And others have said that that, uh, Mark Medina said that a concern for the team with Jeremy is his shot clock management, meaning how if you're shooting the ball too quickly or if the offense is running too fast or if it's running, it's not getting into the the offensive sets quickly enough. So that's, uh, that's acceptable. I accept that. I think those are can be legitimate criticisms given this team, this coach, this system, and the personnel on the team. 
However, what I don't like is people talking about Jeremy like he's still the same player that he always was. He hasn't improved. He's really not that good, and so on. And that's just not accurate. That's simply inaccurate. And anybody that's followed Jeremy's career could tell you that. So what's beginning to happen or what's beginning to take shape is the thought that maybe Jeremy won't be around on this team next year, one reason or another. Maybe the Lakers trade him. Maybe they don't re-sign him. Maybe Jeremy himself decides not to return because his contract is up th- this at the end of this year. Maybe the Lakers trade him during the season because his contract is expiring and it's relatively large. Well, it's actually it's it's average, but it looks larger because of the uh, the way it's set up. And he might be the Lakers' best trade asset. So there are different things, but you can definitely see that the 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 page in the book has been turned. We went from a couple of weeks ago, Kobe saying that he loves Lynn's ability and he wants to help make Jeremy a championship point guard to now Adrian Wojnarowski saying that Jeremy Lynn looks like a one-year player for the Lakers. And that's what it is. And that's, again, that's the backdrop of, of what I was feeling going into this game. So then watching... Uh, watching Jeremy have his challenges during this game just kind of fueled the fire in, in terms of me personally. Most people know for me, I'm very, I tend to be very even keeled, very steady, not really too much up and down. But last night, it just, uh, you know, it got the better of me. And I apologize to people on Twitter. There are people unhappy with me for that. And, and, and I accept that. So I'm not above making mistakes and I'm not above apologizing. Anybody, Anybody that comments or analyzes anything is capable of making mistakes and doing things they should not do. So I, I definitely apologize for that, for those people who were disappointed in my comments last night on Twitter. So that's where it came from. It's just I'm frustrated, not for myself, but for Jeremy and for Jeremy's fans. I don't get anything from Jeremy playing. It doesn't it's not my life. It's not it's not me and Jeremy doesn't have to do anything for my life to be okay or meaningful. We're fans. You you somewhat emotionally connect with the player that you like and in some regards you live vicariously through them when you watch them. But I don't I I there's a line. I don't if whatever Jeremy does, whatever he's going to do, and I'm going to do what, what I do. And so it has no effect on me personally. I know that Jeremy is going to be successful in his life. He's already been successful beyond most people's uh, expectations of him, at least as regards basketball. He's made a bunch of money. He's going to make a whole bunch more money. He's doing good things with his with his money and his time in terms of his foundation and helping the underprivileged. So he's got a great education. He's grounded in his faith. So I have no concerns about Jeremy Lin as a person or or for his life. My concern usually with, with all this is how is his basketball career going? And I want to see him improve. I want to see him reach his potential. And I want to see him be treated fairly by coaches, by the media, by other NBA players. So that's where my stuff comes in. If Jeremy quit the NBA tomorrow, okay, I wouldn't. Life goes on. But while he's playing, I'm just going to analyze it and react to it to the extent that I can. And that's, that's where my focus is coming from. All right. Now let's turn back to the game itself and let's talk about it. What happened overall in this game was the Lakers did very well early. At the end of the first quarter, they led by six points. And I believe the lead got even bigger early in the second quarter. 
to be completely honest with you, again, we we try to be as honest as we can. That means if if Jeremy played poorly or something, we're going to tell you that, even though we make these videos for Jeremy Lin fans. We, you can't make stuff up. You have to be straight up, and that's what we try to do. My personal opinion of how this game went was that when Jeremy and Carlos Boozer came back into the game in the second quarter, I thought that's when the Wizards started to turn things around. Now, is that all Jeremy's fault? No. Is it just a coincidence? Maybe. But that's that was the period of time when Washington started to figure things out. And up until that period of time, that didn't happen. Now, to be fair to Jeremy, he was part of of why the Lakers got the lead in the first quarter. So, again, I'm, I'm definitely not blaming all this on him because he was fantastic early. Had a bunch of assists, playing good defense on John Wall, etc. But I do think that, that that's what took place in the second quarter. Or, or that is when, in terms of game time, that's when Washington started to make a run. And they... Washington got their confidence. They started feeling good about themselves. And by the time we went to halftime, it was 54-52 Washington, I believe. So they had come all the way back, and they had found their rhythm. That continued in the third quarter. And so it was almost like watching two different games. The first game was Lakers- in control, in in a good flow, playing the way they want to play. And the second game was, now Washington's found their rhythm, LA's lost their momentum, and they can't get it back. And that's kind of how it went. And then it just got, in the second half, it got further and further away from the Lakers, although they did make a run late. They did get the lead down to about four points, I believe, in the fourth quarter. But then Washington just kind of pulled away again. Also, Jeremy did not play late in the fourth quarter. Ronnie Price was on the the court instead, which I have no problem with that because Ronnie played very well in this game. And Jeremy was struggling. And so Coach Scott decided to stay with Ronnie or go with Ronnie. And I understand why he did that. You want to win the game. You have a situation where Ronnie's playing maybe his best game of the year. Jeremy may be playing his worst game of the year. So you're going to go with that guy. This isn't like McHale with the hot stock, cold stock, where he can he can change who, who finishes the game game by game. This was, I think, a unique situation. And so I, I respect what Byron did there. And, and uh, uh, it it nearly worked. So, also after the game, Byron was like, "Yeah, Jeremy just had a bad night." So he just he just threw it away. He wasn't going off, or he wasn't saying things like Mikhail has said, where yeah, Jeremy sometimes Jeremy's it's almost like he's playing for the other team, this type of thing. So there was none of that, which was good to see. So I respect what Byron said there and the way he he treated Jeremy, and that's good to see. Also after the game, Jeremy himself was disappointed, but he wasn't down on himself in the post-game interview, which is critical. If you remember his first year in Houston, he would be so down on himself, and I believe he mentioned it in the interview. I only saw a clip of it. I did not see the entire interview. I think he mentioned in the past he would have been really down on himself, but now he's not. That's, as a a Lynn observer and Lynn fan, that's progress. So even if he had a tough game, he's progressing in that regard. So just seeing that makes me okay with this game because now I know that, that from the mental perspective, Jeremy's figuring it out. 
uh, I'll just let me let me just talk about the turnovers now instead of talking them in, in quarter by quarter. As I said earlier, the turnovers Jeremy committed three of them. There was one of them that wasn't his fault, I believe, or or was a separate situation. The reason why I was un- unhappy with the turnovers was they felt like panicky type of turnovers, like over-anxious type of turnovers, and preventable turnovers. That's the easiest way to, to represent it. Two of them at least, and maybe three of them, were Jeremy's out on the perimeter of the offense, and he's waiting to make a pass from basically one zone. And that, when I, if you think of the, the, the court in three different zones, left side, middle, right side. So he's looking to make a pass in one zone, like left to middle, middle to right, right to middle. And the defender read the pass and just intercepted it. And that frustrated me because if you just, if you wait for the defender, if you just let the defender go for the steal and then make the pass, you can easily prevent those turnovers in most cases. And it felt like what happened, what it felt like with Jeremy was he kind of got into a little bit of a rut, like with his shooting. And it was almost like his entire confidence structure fell apart. And he went into kind of panic mode. That's what it looked like observing it. I'm not in Jeremy's head, so I can't tell you. But this is something that Jeremy has struggled with before. So when people talk about Jeremy and his confidence, or they talk about Jeremy and overthinking This is what they're talking about. They're talking about moments like this. And I think the overthinking and I I guess you could call it underthinking where he's, he's just rushing and not thinking at all. It's the same. It's two sides of the same coin. They're related. It's like Jeremy's getting stressed. And it's either coming out where he's got he's really got to think a whole bunch or he doesn't think at all. Jeremy has talked about this before. He's mentioned in his testimony, I believe, this summer over in Taiwan. I think, it, yes, it was in Taiwan or, or China, but I believe it was Taiwan. He said that when he was in Houston, he would get so nervous before games He couldn't sleep, he couldn't eat, and it would totally mess him up. So this isn't a, this isn't a radical idea I'm proposing here. He said it himself, and many other people have observed this type of thing with Jeremy, whatever you want to call it, confidence, whatever label you put on it. Now, this type of an issue happens all the time to basketball players and to other athletes also. You'll see players, sometimes they'll throw up before the game or they'll throw up during the game because they're stressed out. You'll see players where it's almost like, it's like a stage fright thing almost, like for a band or performer in a band. They're great. They're awesome until they get on stage and then they freak out. LeBron James, as I have mentioned, has an issue like this. And he had to work on it. He talked with somebody. I don't know who. Maybe a sports psychologist. Whoever it was instructed LeBron. Why don't you read a book before the game? And my and this is where you saw LeBron a couple of years ago. Is like he would read reading the Hunger Games book before he would go out and play. Very intelligent people tend to think a lot. LeBron's a very smart person. Jeremy's a very smart person. And what can happen, and I, and I can I can personally relate to this because I have this issue somewhat myself. 
sometimes you simply think too much or you you are too conscious of what the ramifications are if you mess up. And so this is where the, the phrase ignorance is bliss comes from. If you don't know anything or you don't care about anything, who cares if you mess up? And But it's not easy for people, and it's often not easy for, for more intelligent people. I said on Twitter last night, and I have said this before, and I may say it again at some point, Jeremy might benefit from working with a sports psychologist or somebody like that. And I don't care what Jeremy does. I don't care if he works with a sports psychologist. I don't care if he works with a pastor or he works with just his friends or he does he reads a self-help book about how to manage stress. I just want to see him succeed. So it doesn't matter to me what he does or doesn't do. To me, seeing a sports psychologist is not a bad thing. Many performers in various sports do this. I, I know somebody that recently saw a sports psychologist in, in boxing is Carl Froch, who's a great fighter, a terrific fighter. People go and do this because they want to maximize their performance. LeBron, like he worked with somebody. I don't know who, but someone. Jeremy has worked on this, and he himself has said that now I believe he reads the Bible before games, and it calms him down. So he's worked at this. And usually when you're stressed out, when these little episodes happen, they only happen in a very intense moment. For LeBron, it might come in the playoffs. For Jeremy, it might come in a game where he's shooting 0 of 10, and the team's losing. But in other moments, it doesn't happen. So, it's a it's a tangible thing. And it is something that can be improved. And I am certain that Jeremy and his team will continue to work on this from whatever angle or angles they choose to do so. I'm definitely not saying it's some insolvable issue. It's not. It's very solvable. And obviously, Jeremy has made progress on it. It's It just came up last night. And this is something that affects him, I believe, in other respects of his game, not just passing. I think this also would be a thing like with his dribbling. Earlier in the season, when he was just trying to get settled in with the team, You'd see instances where he'd lose the ball or you know, fall down dribbling, which you know he's a better dribbler than that. So then you, you figure it's probably some type of a, uh, overthinking type of a deal or an anxious type of a deal. Now you never see that. You, you hardly ever see Jeremy make those type of ball handling mistakes. Very rare. So... We just want to see everybody, everybody that's a Lynn fan, wants to see Jeremy be able to perform at the level that he's capable of performing at. Because we know what he can do. And so we just, hopefully he can, he and his team can get him in the best position to do that. What's frustrating with these reporters or these, the, the, the talking heads is that they will often treat Jeremy like that doesn't exist. They will treat his good performances like flukes and try to emphasize the negative performances or maybe performances where this stress issue is more of a factor. And that's frustrating as Jeremy has improved steadily in his career. He's a very capable player. I have no question in my mind that he's starter caliber player, even in a league that is very rich in point guard talent right now. So again, that's where a lot of the frustration came for me personally last night. I hate to see it, it's like when you see somebody unfairly criticized, you want to see them defeat the criticism. You want to see them rise above. And last night it felt like 
Jeremy was falling into it, falling into the pit of the doubters. And that's why I got frustrated. That's that's where my frustration was coming from. And look, it doesn't matter. It's a long season. The Lakers seem to have decided that they want Kobe to play more point guard since the Minnesota game. They may make lineup changes. There's a chance Jeremy won't start, but his career goes on beyond whatever happens this year with the Lakers. Again, I would like to see him. I think L.A. is a good market for him. I think the Lakers are a good team for him. But I'm not married to the Lakers, just personally as a Jeremy Lin observer. If he needs to go to another team, or if another team or another coach or another situation is better for him, then let him go. That's fine. That's okay. There are definitely offensive systems that would work better for Jeremy than what Byron Scott is running with Kobe Bryant. There's no question about that. What the Spurs do would fit Jeremy better. What the Mavericks do would fit Jeremy better. There, are, So that, that, that exists. That's reality. We'll see. We have to see how the year plays out. No matter what happens with Jeremy, I'm not going to give up on him. I'm not going to stop covering him or anything, even if he's, if the Lakers bring him off the bench or any of that stuff. The good part for Jeremy is his deal will be up after this year, and he can do whatever he wants. He can go to whatever team he wants to go to that's interested in him. So we'll just take it from there. Um, and it, We'll see. We'll see what, what he and his team and the Lakers and decide to do. We'll just have to take it as it comes. So now getting back to the game. So the overall, I already explained. Lakers started fast, and they kind of ran out of steam. Let's go over some individual stats quickly. Kobe, 29 points, 4 rebounds, 3 assists. Shot 8 out of 22 for the game. Kobe, um, I think his best stretch of the game was in the third quarter when he scored like 12 points or something like that. He had his moments. Um, You know, he's not shooting a high percentage, but he is needed for shot creation and distribution. He is a very good passer when he wants to be. And the best thing for Kobe in that regard is he can draw a double team and effectively pass out of it. If you are drawing a double team to yourself, that means somebody else is wide open. And if you, as the passer in that situation, can find that player, your team wins because you're going to get wide open shots. So, I respect Kobe as a facilitator. We don't want to just say, well, the Lakers aren't letting Jeremy facilitate and nobody else is, is any good at it. No, Kobe's good at it when he wants to be. Also, though, Kobe has much more discretion than Jeremy does, meaning that Kobe can play facilitator for two quarters and then he can decide to play scorer for two quarters, whereas Jeremy doesn't get that, that flexibility whether you think he deserves it or not. I, I think he, he does deserve it, but he's not going to get the same latitude, obviously. Uh, that's what we found out, apparently, after the Minnesota game. So, Carlos Boozer, 10 points, 8 rebounds. Nick Young had a real nice game off the bench, 21 points, including 5 of 8 three-pointers. Ronnie Price had his best game of the year. 11 points, 2 rebounds, 4 assists. It was four of four shooting, including three of three from three-point land. Two steals. Did have two turnovers, but Ronnie played great. He really played well, and you have to give him credit for that. I was happy for Ronnie because he struggled a lot this year, and tonight when Jeremy struggled, Ronnie played very well. So that was really good to see. Jordan Hill, eight points, six rebounds. Jeremy Zero points. 21 minutes played. Zero of 10 from the field, including zero of six from three-point range. No free throw attempts. Four rebounds. Five assists. Zero steals. One block shot. Four turnovers. His plus minus was a minus 18, that which was not even close to the worst on the team. Kobe and Wesley Johnson were both minus 30. So this was this was the toughest game for Jeremy this year. 
He only played 21 minutes. He wasn't effective with the shot, and he did turn the ball over four times. He did have five assists, and he was he was distributing the ball very well early. Turning to the Wizards, Bradley Beal, 27 points, 7 assists. John Wall, 17 points, 15 assists, but it took him 18 shots to get 17 points, which is not good. Four turnovers. Marcin Gortat, 21 points, 11 rebounds. Paul Pierce, 14 points, 5 rebounds. Chris Humphreys, 6 points, 20 rebounds. Rasul Butler came off the bench for 14 points, 4 rebounds. Talking about Jeremy just more specifically, and I might do a little bit of quarter by quarter here in this game. Jeremy played good defense in this game. He played good defense against John Wall. Very good. He had one particular play, I think it was in the third quarter, where John Wall was coming up the court with the ball in his hands in transition, and Jeremy basically stayed stride for stride with him, stripped the ball out of his hands and out of bounds. It should have been Lakers' ball because it went off John Wall. But the Lakers, excuse me, the referees gave the ball to the Wizards instead. But John Wall, full speed in transition, is one of the hardest people in the league to stop. Almost like Jeremy. Because Wall is incredibly fast. Extremely fast. And so that was a designed play by by Wall, basically. He knows how quick he is. I'm going to get back and get to the rim before the defense can set up. Credit to Jeremy on that play. And he he wasn't perfect against John Wall, but he did a good job against John Wall all night. He did. So as much as people will say this was a bad game, he played very good defense. Also, most of the shots, and pretty much all of them, were good shots, open shots. They just didn't go in tonight. It's, maybe it's the back-to-back. Sometimes you just have tough shooting nights. Everybody does. Now, some people are telling me that uh, Tony Parker was 0 of 12 in a game or something. So this happens. uh, The shooting doesn't bother me at all. What Jeremy said himself after the game was that all of his his shots were on line. I mean, they were on target. They were just a little too long. Like he put a little too much power into them, and so they were hitting off the back of the rim. That's, That's what he said. So... Again, no problem with that. He was definitely passing the ball well, particularly early. He was racking up assist quickly. Then the defense was good. The offense was, the shot was struggling. The passing was good. And the finding people was good. Like I said, my only personal problem was it with tonight, with this game, was being careful on the, on a couple of the turnovers, two or three of them. That that that's the only issue I had. Like I said, I'm so I'm not even down to Jeremy about the game. It was more of, of the, the 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 commentary about Jeremy coming into the game that upset me. I didn't think the Lakers were going to win this game. The Wizards are a good team, and you're playing them at home. You're on a back-to-back on the road, and they're at home, and they're rested. So I didn't expect the Lakers to win this game, although they could have. I was just, again, I was charged up because of all of this negative talk about Jeremy. That was in the in the air. Um, okay, let's, and again, the way that you counteract these turnovers that Jeremy did have, one, work on work on slowing down the thought process. Whatever it is that he and Jeremy up, he and his team can just work on just improving that. It, as I said, it's already improved, and I continue. I expect it to continue to improve and get better and better to where he doesn't get this. And to be fair to Jeremy, some of this has to do with how he's been treated. Some of this is the Houston PTSD, and some of it is the way he's being talked about now. Jeremy's played great this year, and yet all of a sudden now there's all this negativity 
Well, that's not going to give you any confidence. That's going to take away your confidence. I mean, it's almost like a chihuahua. You see chihuahuas, little small dogs. They're always scared all the time. Well, they're scared because they're small. If they were big, they probably wouldn't be so scared. So if Jeremy was being treated differently by his coaches, or if he had been treated differently along the way, then he probably wouldn't be scared right now, or he wouldn't be uptight. You know what I'm saying? So it's, I'm not, this isn't, I mean, a lot of guys that are on the bubble in the NBA, whether they might get cut or whether they're on the bubble of being a starter or a bench player, well, those guys are going to be the most anxious because they have a reason to be anxious. And so what I'm saying for Jeremy is, is this isn't irrational. I understand that he feels this way, and a lot of us might feel the same way in his position. It, it is irrational in certain respects, from my opinion, that he's treated this way, that he's looked at as maybe not a starter or maybe a guy you're going to move to the bench based on his performance. I, that, to me, is irrational because I think he's better than that. But I'm not the coach. Jeremy's not the coach, so you got to deal with it. Still, he said, some people on Twitter said that to me. Look, if he had a nurturing coach, a nurturing environment, then he wouldn't, that would give him confidence. Absolutely. That's the, that's the goal. We wish that he did have that. And when he makes his choice at the end of the season to go wherever he wants, hopefully he will get that. My concern is that he might not get that. And so even if he doesn't get the best supportive coach or the most supportive teammates, I still want him to be able to be mentally tough no matter what. And that's why I brought up the stuff with sports psychologists or whatever. I want Jeremy to be able to solve his own problems regardless of what anybody says about him, regardless of how any coach treats him and regardless of how any teammate treats him so I want it to be his own empowerment to be able to be strong in that sense so that's where I'm coming from but if if he can get the proper support and the right environment uh, great absolutely 100% perfect and to be fair that might not happen in Los Angeles right now right now as I've said many times before Los Angeles Lakers are playing Kobe ball and they will continue to play Kobe ball until Kobe retires. And I said that I, I, I warned Lynn fans about that before the season. My opinion, Byron Scott was hired to coach Kobe Bryant. He was hired partly because Kobe wanted him to be hired. Everything is going to be about Kobe until Kobe retires. Now that, looks like it will happen at the end of next season, but it, maybe it doesn't happen. And we still have to get through this season and all of next season. Well, maybe Jeremy doesn't want to deal with that. Maybe he goes to another team next year on a one-year deal, and then Kobe retires, and maybe Jeremy goes back to the Lakers. So there are different possibilities. We will see what happens, but you've heard discussions of people saying that there are players in the league who don't want to play with Kobe or many players. Well, those conversations don't come from nowhere. The thinking is that if you play with Kobe, you have to deal with Kobe ball and you have to deal with the cult of Kobe, uh, the, the mythologizing and the, the, the putting on the pedestal of Kobe. And when the team loses, it's the teammates' fault. When the team wins, Kobe led them. This is just, this is the way it goes. There's this, the, again, the cult of Kobe. And now we're going into Kobe's going to pass Jordan in points, etc. So there's going to be a lot of this. And if Kobe keeps playing beyond next year, then it's going to be Kobe's going to be the all-time leading scorer. So... 
this is part of the package with the Lakers at this present time. When Kobe retires, then things change. Does does Jeremy want to be there during this period of time? I don't know. Because it's going to be a lot of this. This happens to all of Kobe's teammates. All of them. It's happened since Shaq, and I'm sure it will continue to happen. So maybe it, it's not the best place for him right now, even though it's a great market for him, and he loves the, the city, and uh, he's in California, which is where he's from. So... Okay, let's just go through some selected quarter-by-quarter quarter stuff here. I have a ton of notes. Um, I'm not going to go through everything. Okay. Um, early in the first, Jeremy had a nice pocket pass. Just A pocket pass just means it's it, – it, it, I think it refers to like a pick-and-roll play where you – there's a little pocket of space where – you have an opening to pass to, and that's where you should pass it. There's a window to pass it into. So Jeremy and Jordan Hill ran the pick and roll. Jeremy hit him with the perfect pass into that into the pocket, and Jordan Hill scored a layup. Then, also early in the first, Jeremy passed the ball to Kobe for a jump shot. Then he passed to Kobe for another jump shot. So within the first four minutes of the game, Jeremy already had three assists. He was playing great. He was playing great. He had missed two shots. But again, these were clean looks. One was an open three-pointer and that he got knocked down on and there was no foul. And the other one was a little step-back jump shot off the dribble from the free throw line. Those are good looks. He just he just missed them. The ball didn't go in. Then, moving into the middle of the first, he missed a layup. I don't remember exactly what happened on that play. Then he had his fourth assist of the game. I, th- I think Jeremy stole the ball, and then he passed it ahead to Carlos Boozer for a layup. So four of his assists came within like the first five or six minutes of the game. And he only ended up with five assists. So I said he played great early. Really great. Then he he had another missed shot, which was a three-pointer from about 40 degrees left of the top of the arc. So right now he was 0-4. And then he had his first turnover. The pass, he was passing the ball and was intercepted by Bradley Beal. I did not see that turnover. So I can't. I don't know if that was similar to these other turnovers I was telling you about that happened later in the game. I'm, I'm really not sure. I made a note that says Jeremy was aggressive. So he's no hesitation. And Wesley Johnson was playing the same way. So he came out ready to play. He was ready to compete. And he played the right way. So it's even people will say this is such a bad game. It didn't start that way. And, and so credit to him. Okay, then he had his first blown assist of the game. He, I, he had a really nice full court pass up ahead to Kobe. And Kobe missed a reverse layup in transition. Like there was one man back and it was a nice, it was a nice shot by Kobe. It just, it, it, he didn't quite get the right bounce off the backboard. And it didn't go in. Or that would have been Jeremy's fifth assist. Then Jeremy got himself freed up for a jump shot along the, the, uh, I believe, the right baseline. He had a really nice dribble move. Just lost his defender. And just the shot didn't go in. So at this point, this is still the middle of the first. He was 0-5. But again, plain, no hesitation. A lot of... Is honestly, this was almost like a insanity groove for him. He just wasn't hitting shots because Lin- true insanity is scoring and passing. So he already should have had five assists. And if he had hit his shots at this point, if, may, just say he made, I don't know, three or five of them, he would have already had like eight points in the first eight minutes of the game. So he was playing perfectly. He was playing the way the team wants him to play. That's probably another reason Byron wasn't that mad. Jeremy played the way you want him to play. Very decisive, very aggressive. So, good. 
Then late in the first, Ronnie came in for Jeremy with three minutes and 39 seconds left in the, in the quarter. And at that point, it was 18 to 18 tied score. And I made the note, Lynn playing point guard tonight. So Kobe was letting him play point guard. And we said Kobe can't play point guard every single night. It's, it's very physically demanding to play the point guard because you have to, you're the one handling the ball most of the time. And so if guys are coming up to pressure you, you've got to work harder to dribble around them. You've got to make decisions. And it takes a lot of effort. And as I've said, this is why Kobe is not hardened. Kobe doesn't want to play point guard at this point in his career. He wants to, on offense, he wants to set up around the elbow where the uh, where the, the paint meets the free throw line, and he wants to play in the low post. He just wants to sit there and get his shots and run the offense from there. So if he has to play point, it's much more physically draining on him. And we know Kobe was exhausted after the Toronto game. He can't he can't do that every single night. And if he tries to do it, there's a good chance he's going to get hurt again, which, of course, he doesn't want to happen. Okay, then I put Wall at this point in the game, late in the first, was only one of four shooting. So John Wall had already started out shooting not so well, but he was passing the ball well because he already had four assists late in the, in the first, and he finished the quarter with five assists. So he was definitely performing well, if not perfectly, as regards his shooting. Okay, heading into the second, Jeremy started the quarter on the bench, and the announcer said that they loved Nick Young's swagginess, which is good. And basically, Lynn, uh, Nick's swagging, he, you know, the, the, the confidence and everything, I just wish they would say that about Jeremy. What we hear with Jeremy is, well, maybe Jeremy's not doesn't have point guard instincts. With the implication meaning that he's shooting too much or something, or he's looking to score too much. So you like Nick's swagginess, and Nick will take terrible shots at times. Air balls. And, so you like Nick's swagginess, but Jeremy doesn't have point guard instincts. It's... So, like I said, look, these are the things that these are the things that Jeremy Lin fans observe and hear that makes them question the announcers or or the potential bias of the announcers. Why can't Jeremy be allowed to be swaggy? But, but Nick Young is, even when Nick Young's shooting two for 12 in a game. That's, that's okay, and it's okay when Kobe has 10 turnovers, but it's not okay for Jeremy. And this is the type of thing, this is what's really annoying if you're a fan of Jeremy Lin. We, we all dealt with it in Houston with Clyde Drexler and others. So it would be nice if, if Jeremy had the same kind of latitude that some of these other guys get. I mean, he had a great game, I think, in, against Minnesota, didn't he? Not the, like, 18-point, 11-assist game. But then it was like the whole world fell apart. It was like it was almost too good or something. I know Joyce Ward was saying that she thought Kobe was jealous of Jeremy and the attention he was getting after that game. I, I don't know, but all we were hearing was boneheaded plays and no point guard instincts even after he put up big numbers. It's just, so that that's frustrating. It's very frustrating. It doesn't seem even-handed in terms of this, this criticism and, and praising that goes on for different players and, and not the same for other players. Then Stu Lance was praising Ronnie Price for a defensive play, which he should have. It was a great play by Ronnie, got a steal. And, and Stu Lance said something like, that's what that's what Ronnie does or whatever, which it is what he does. Like I said, just hopefully we will praise everybody. Then Ronnie hit a three-pointer, which is a nice shot. And Ronnie came into the game shooting like 28% or, or less from three. So it was great to see that ball go in. Then middle of the second... But that Nick Young was was uh, he was doing the swaggy stuff like he was doing a little theatrics, but it's funny, you know. But um, 
Nick, Nick's definitely his own guy. And I like Nick. Nick's a good guy. Then I put Ronnie is in assist mode. Ronnie was really looking for passes. He was in a good groove, man. I mean, he really had it tonight. He really looked good in this game. And again, I'm, I'm happy for him. The team needed it with Jeremy being a little off. And for Ronnie's own confidence, it's good to see. Then Kobe banged his knee, like hit knees with somebody on, on the Wizards, and he could barely walk after that. And everybody was like, oh, no. I thought it might have been a more serious injury, but it wasn't, and he was able to stay in the game, so that was really good. Then I put middle of the second that – well, I put – it looked like Byron wasn't going to take Ronnie out at that time, but then he did right after that just because Ronnie was playing well. I understand that. But he put Jeremy back into the game, four minutes and 45 seconds left in the second quarter. Then right after that, right after Jeremy came in, he had this first of these turnovers. Now, to be of these kind of avoidable turnovers, to be fair to Jeremy on this play, this was the second turnover him for the game, he passed the ball to Carlos Boozer. And the ball ended up going out of bounds. Carlos could have gotten the ball, but he let it go out of bounds. I think he let it go out of bounds because I believe he thought Washington touched it. But he, it, apparently Carlos touched it last. It went out of bounds. And I think soon after that play, Byron Scott took Carlos out of the game. Because I think he was disappointed in Carlos's effort. But still, Jer- Jeremy could have made a better pass on that on that particular play. He could have been a little bit more judicious and when he made the pass. And so this is what I said to myself, like, uh-oh, uh, you know, he's he looks, he looks a little bit amped up in a negative way. Like maybe you're thinking a little bit too much right now. And this is my first kind of just my own personal note, like, uh uh-oh, uh-oh, oh, slow down, slow down a little bit. Then heading late in the second, Jeremy missed his sixth shot of the game. This was a three-pointer from about 15 degrees right at the top of the arc. Again, clean look. It was a good look. Just, Just didn't go in. Then Jeremy got his first foul of the game, which was a great idea. He tried to take a charge against one of the Wizards, and he would have gotten the call except that his his feet were just barely into the restricted area. The restricted area is the the little small circle or half circle that is drawn right underneath the basket. What the restricted area means is that the defender is not allowed to stand in that spot and draw a charge. Basically, the the principle is you must allow the offensive player to go towards the basket. So that zone is allowable for the offensive player to be going forward. You can't stand there and try to take a charge. Basically, it's not fair to the offensive player is the principle of it. So Jeremy was just, just had his feet just barely on the line. But it was a great, he was a smart play. He knew what he was trying to do. It just that happens all the time. Players try to take charges, and they're just slightly into the restricted area. Then he made a nice play where he forced John Wall into a missed layup. So, he was again, he was playing good defense. He then had his second blown assist. Jordan Hill missed a jump shot. Then he had his third turnover, and this was to Kobe. He was passing the ball to Kobe, and after the pass, you could see Kobe kind of like look down a little bit. Might have been a little bit mad at himself. Might have been a little mad at Jeremy. But this is where I made the note, and this is where I was starting to get frustrated. Because at this point, Jeremy was he was about to be 0 for 7 shooting. He just uh, he got his three-point shot attempt blocked at the halftime buzzer. But the pass to Kobe, in my opinion, definitely looked like he was too amped up. And these are the situations where Jeremy will get amped up. 
Washington was making a run. The Lakers were losing their lead. And you can see times where Jeremy will will play a little bit too fast in those circumstances. You might see him like on offense, not just with passes, but he'll he'll kind of lock in on driving to the rim and maybe make some mistakes that he would normally make when at other points in the game. Or he'll maybe he'll he'll force passes in a sense. You almost get the feeling with Jeremy when he's at these moments like he feels like he has to do everything himself. And so it's kind of like he's got to go into like like Superman mode. And so I would just say to him, it's just just slow down, use your teammates, one one possession at a time. And what you'll hear coaches talk about is they'll talk about valuing possessions. And what that means is you can't think, well, even if we don't perform well in this possession, we've got 10 more possessions at the end of the game. You can't think like that. You have to think like, I've got to be locked in. I have to be focused on every single possession. And so you will usually hear the term value possessions when there's a whole bunch of turnovers involved. And it's usually a negative thing. Like we're not valuing the possessions enough. And so for Jeremy... Take your time on each pass. And and I, as I mentioned earlier, Jeremy does have an issue with this. He does have a consistent issue with this. Sometimes he'll just get whatever it is, a little too lackadaisical, a little too casual, and defenders are looking for it because that stuff will show up on video. So when they're preparing for teams, they'll be like, yeah, you know, I might be able to get a steal there. Maybe Jeremy's not quite... Maybe he's not concentrating quite enough. So, again, you, you don't want to overthink it. Uh, Jeremy doesn't need to do a 10-month a turnover seminar. Just on those plays, the best thing you can do on those plays, I think I did, I might have mentioned this earlier, and I'm, I apologize if I'm repeating. If the defender goes to make a steal, fake the pass. So you pretend you're going to pass it. If the defender's looking for a steal, you'll catch them. They will go up, and then your man will either open for like a – they can either get towards a basket, and you can pass the ball behind the defender. Or else, once the defender goes for it and sees that he can't get it, then your man will be like – will usually be wide open shortly thereafter. Like the defender will go for the steal once. If they don't get it, then they won't go for the steal right after that. So it, it's not hard to make these plays. And to be fair to Jeremy, something that Stu Lance has has said before regarding the way that this offense is run by Byron Scott, the angle, the angle of these passes, because they're usually, they're usually going to like the elbow. They're usually going to where the paint meets, meets the free throw line extended like maybe a little bit higher up from that but in that general area the angle that's required for those passes is a very difficult angle it's an angle that's easy to turn the ball over when you're making passes so it'd be that's true that that is that is accurate so it makes it harder for Jeremy so he just needs to again just just calm down and try to make that difficult angle as workable for yourself as possible. And so that's it. I said, I had no other problems with the way Jeremy played tonight, except for the turnover issue. And that's when it was really frustrating to watch there late in the, uh, the, the second quarter because he already had three turnovers, and he was only going to get one more for the rest of the game. So... He did better in the second half, although he didn't play as much. Okay, going into the third quarter, um, Jeremy early on fouled John Wall on an and one play. So John Wall scored and Jeremy fouled him, but I made a note that it wasn't. I don't think he got the proper help defense on the play. And as I said earlier, at this point in the game, Washington was feeling pretty good. 
So they were kind of uh, running downhill, as the phrase goes, meaning they had a full head of steam now. Their confidence was intact. They had momentum. They had rhythm. And I also said on Twitter, (laughs) this was annoying to watch, in particular between John Wall and Jeremy, because John Wall, at this point in the game, knew Jeremy was struggling a little bit. And so he was attacking Jeremy. It's like it's almost like a lion going after a wounded wounded member of the herd. And so I was like, oh, man, here we go. Now, of course, Jeremy famously got the better of John Wall a couple of times in summer league, I believe, or at least once. That's part of that's part of how Jeremy made his name. So it's not surprising if John Wall wants to do well against Jeremy kind of like a payback. It's almost like Darren Williams and Jeremy. Lynn's sanity began in New York when Jeremy did really well against Darren Williams. When Darren Williams was, uh, I guess, I think Darren was with either the, yeah, he's with the Nets then. I don't know if there was New Jersey still or, or Brooklyn. And so every time Darren plays Jeremy, he always tries to do well now. It's like the continual payback thing. So I'm sure John Wall has some of that with Jeremy, but I, I'm sure they respect each other as well, too. They're, they're both, they have some similar qualities. They're Both of their best feature is probably their speed. They're both extremely fast. And I think they're in the same draft class. Or, well, Jeremy didn't get drafted, but I think they came out the same year, I, I believe. Okay, then Jeremy missed two more shots. He missed a three from the top of the arc. And then he missed, I I don't remember what the the shot was. And then after that, I put confidence gone. Now, to be fair to Jeremy, I I don't think that's true. Actually, based upon what he said after the game, his confidence wasn't gone, which is I'm very happy to hear. The, The best thing about this game, the best thing about this game, in addition to Jeremy's interview after the game, was that he kept shooting. He didn't go into a turtle shell and say, well, oh, I can't hit any shots, so I'm going to stop taking shots. He didn't do that. And if you know, Kobe said somewhat recently, and I can't remember who he was talking about, He was talking about a player, and the player went, like, in a particular game, the player was, like, that player was, like, 0 of 11 shooting. And Kobe said something like, well, if that was me, I would have gone, like, you know, I'd rather go 0 of of 20 than 0 of 11, meaning I'm going to keep shooting, which is the approach that you should take. So to Jeremy's credit, he kept shooting. He stayed aggressive. And he was committed to working through this little funk that he got into. So, for whatever negatives occurred in this game, he continued to shoot and he worked his way through it. He was still competing very, very hard despite how he was shooting. That's what you want to see. That's real progress for Jeremy, particularly with this team. He did what he was supposed to do. He just, he didn't make shots. And again, you take your time on the turnovers, but he kept shooting. He didn't let his poor shooting take his mind out of the game. And after the game, he wasn't down on himself. That is... That's like I said, that's real progress for him. And so it's, I'm, and, and looking back at the game, I'm a lot happier than, than I was during the moment because a lot of life, a lot of success in anything you do is how do you, how do you deal with adversity? And he dealt with it well. He dealt with it well. Except, like I said, man, maybe the turnovers, the turnovers. Other than that, good defense. Kept shooting, not too hard on himself after the game. And you didn't let 
the shooting take your mind away from how else you could contribute? And I know that John Ireland, who is the, I believe he does the radio broadcast for the Lakers, and he also does the interviews for Time Warner Cable right after the game. He said that to Jeremy. He's like, yeah, I could see how hard you were competing, even though you didn't shoot well. And, and that's a compliment. And Jeremy Jeremy was he was very good about it. As I said, it's, it's, so, it's so different than how he was in Houston. It's just great to see. If you remember, Jeremy, some of these post-game interviews in Houston, I mean, he's almost like you could barely hear him talk, uh, uh, mumbling and stuff, and he'd always be looking down. Because he's taking the, he takes the losses so hard. Now he didn't do that. That's how you have to do it. No matter how poorly you play, it's only one game. And no matter what the coach does, no matter if the coach is putting a blame on you and you shouldn't be blamed, no matter if the coach decides to bench you, maybe you shouldn't be benched, no matter what the, the, the media people say about you in the city, just control your own your own little cube. Just control what you can control. And Jeremy's definitely doing that better. And, yeah, I want to see more, sure. I want to see him. I see Jeremy as the perfectly 100% optimized player. But he's getting there. He's getting there time and time. What's so frustrating with his doubters and, and, and critics is, so a lot of them, they don't want him to be good. They don't want him to succeed, which is frustrating. So sometimes you'll hear critics of his dissing him and stuff, and they pretend that they're trying to, oh, if he did this, they don't want him to do well. But if you want him to do well, if you're somebody who's actually interested in his progression and success, He's doing that. He's advancing. He's there's he's the best version of a player right now than any other time in his career. There's no question about that in my mind. It's just some of the circumstances and the coaching and the system. He doesn't get to do everything. Doesn't get to show it. But he he's making the march towards his potential being realized. So I, I've said it earlier this year. I'm totally happy with where he's at. Completely happy. If he continues to do this, he's going to get to where he wants to get to. His time will come again. Just continue down this road. And uh, move on to Boston. Boston's a beatable team. So hopefully the Lakers will go and beat them and if Jeremy, if it's if his shot is on, then hopefully he can be a big part of that. <laughs> okay. Then I put Kobe playing point guard. So now Kobe was taking over the ball handling. And to be fair to Kobe, I think he could see Jeremy was a little geeked up. I could see Jeremy was a little bit A little bit overthinking, or whatever you want to call it. And now, of course, can Kobe wants to win the game. And to be fair to Kobe, he doesn't get like that a lot. At least not in this point in his career. He's, much, he's calm, even under duress. So Jeremy can learn from that. So I, I, I didn't, it wasn't surprised that Kobe did that, and I don't have a problem with it. You know, this is, I mean, it's going to happen. So it, it and and it did happen. Then Jeremy had a nice help defense play against Paul Pierce, and he he forced Paul Pierce into a miss. Then Jeremy missed his tenth and final shot of the game. This is still earlier in the third, and I made a note that says Jeremy's trying to fight through it. Like I said he was still. You could see, it was almost like you could see it happening. You could see he was struggling with his confidence or with the overthinking or with the anxiety or whatever. But he was determined to push through it. And I think right around this time on Twitter, I said, if this was Houston, 
Jeremy would already be out of the game, which I think many Land fans would agree with. What I respect about Byron is that he kept Jeremy in. And he kept him in through like a timeout or two of them. Like it wasn't, okay, timeout, then I'm going to make the change. No, he kept him in. So I'm still very, very, very happy as a Jeremy Lin fan that he's not in Houston anymore. Even if this isn't a perfect situation, even if it's going to be Kobe Ball and Jeremy's not going to get the kind of uh, full opportunity that he might get in another place. It was good to see that Byron was trying to let him work through it. And, and, and that's good. And Jeremy did work through it to the extent that he could in this game. And that's good. Okay. Then moving on into the middle of the third, then Jeremy had a nice pass to Carlos Boozer for an assist. And I made the note, Jeremy working through it. Everybody's going to have negative plays or they're going to have a string of negative plays. So now Jeremy was able to get a positive play just as he was in forcing Paul Pierce into the missed jump shot. Then you could see as um, refs were reviewing a call in which Kobe was fouled and Kobe was talking to Jeremy. So, like I said, Jeremy was still had his head in the game. Kobe might know, hey, you know, let me talk to him, kind of ground him out a little bit, calm him down, and it worked. It was nice. And that, right after that, and this is still middle of the third, that's when Jeremy had that terrific defensive play against John Wall. When John Wall went full court transition. Jeremy was with him step for step and pulled the ball out of his hands. And it should have been Lakers' possession. So this was the full cycle here. Jeremy started well, then everything went poorly, and now he's kind of redeemed himself and got his head back into the game and was back to performing well. So it all happened in one game, and it was great. It was just nice to see him be able to get into that place. Then he had his fourth and final turnover of the game. He drew a double team to himself. So he did a good job with this. He, I believe he was looking for Carlos Boozer on a pass right underneath the basket. And it was a good look. But one of the defenders saw the pass coming. And so he was able to intercept it. And... Um, It's in American football, when you are a quarterback person that passes the ball, you always have to be aware of where the safeties are. And a safety, if you're not familiar with the game, a safety is a man that's usually not covering anybody directly, but he's sitting around waiting and he can go and help cover a wide receiver when needed. And so even if a wide receiver beats his own defender, you still got to deal with the safety. And so that's basically what this play was. Carlos was open, and I don't think his man, his man might have gone to double-team Jeremy. But the other defender was playing the role of safety, and Jeremy didn't see him. And so when he made the pass, it was intercepted. So just got to be careful with that and recognize the play completely before you make passes. And uh, look, it was a good, it was a good look. Uh, Carlos was wide open. It just, Jeremy didn't have the angle and he didn't see the guy. He didn't see the defender. So, okay. Um, again, after Jeremy had that turnover, then Kobe went back to playing the point guard again. And which is, again, it, it's not a surprise. Jeremy was mostly struggling, but that's okay. Okay, then Ronnie came into the game for Jeremy with three minutes and 30 seconds left. That time the score was 73 to 63, Washington. And I think, I think that that might have been, it might have been the final substitution. Like Ronnie, Ronnie might have played the, the remainder of the game, and I believe that he did. Again, I have no problem with it. Byron let Jeremy work through his struggles. And it looked like Jeremy was going to be okay then, and then he had that final turnover. 
And then the game was getting a little bit more in Washington's favor. And then he brought in Ronnie just to try to kind of – one, actually, he brought him in on normal rotation. Ronnie will usually come in late in the first and late in the third. And so it's – he actually came in on his normal rotation. So it wasn't really – excuse me, it wasn't really Ron, uh, Byron pulling him. Okay, then going into the fourth quarter – Ronnie had some more good plays. He had another steal, and then I believe he he hit an yeah he hit another three pointer, which took Washington's lead down to four points in the middle of the fourth. So Ronnie helped, and Ronnie was part of a comeback. And the bench did well early in the fourth quarter to try to get the team back into the game. And then Byron just stayed with Ronnie. I understand why that happened. Ronnie hit another three late in the fourth, and. Um, that was basically it. Washington then kind of they withstood the Lakers' charge, and then they went back and they were able to just take over the game and go from there. So, again, I have no – I'm actually happy – I'm actually encouraged, I guess, by the outcome of the game and the way that Jeremy did it. It's good to see him be able to manage some difficult times positively, and you're going to have tough times. You're not going to win every game. You as an individual player are going to struggle in certain games, even when the team does well. And Jeremy worked through it in the game. Byron allowed him to work through it. And then after the game, Byron didn't react negatively to Jeremy's performance. And Jeremy himself didn't react negatively to his own performance. So as much as I don't want to see it, and it was frustrating to watch it during the game. I, I'm actually kind of glad it happened. I, I, it's unfortunate that it happened right now with all this talk going on about Jeremy and lineup changes and everything. But it's going to happen at some point. So it might as well happen now. And let's let Jeremy get through it and we'll learn from it. And it definitely seems like he got through it in a productive and positive way. So, we move on to the next game. The game will take place tomorrow, Friday, December 5th, here in the United States, against the Boston Celtics in Boston, Massachusetts. Boston is 5-11. and The Lakers are 5-14 and on the season. So, again, Boston's not a great team. And it will be at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, which means 4.30 p.m. Pacific Time, and 8.30 a.m. in the morning, on Saturday, December 6th in Taipei, Taiwan. I, as I said, I, I hope I said on Twitter last night, and I said, yeah, I hope Jeremy comes out and wants to destroy Boston. But that was a little bit, that was hyperbole and the frustration talking. He doesn't need to do that. Just just go play your normal game. That's the way you advance beyond a bad game. Just It's like it never happened. Just go right back and just do your thing in steady flow like you've been doing before. Okay, that is about it. Again, my overall thing is this, is I'm a lot more at peace with this game today than I was yesterday. And again, I apologize for being so geeked up myself on Twitter last night. We said that, you know, Jeremy had his struggles. Well, I had my struggles too. <laughs> so I apologize for that. want to thank Gary Chen for the artwork you're looking at right now. Gary is an artist and blogger in Taiwan. And as you can see, he's a very talented artist and i'm sure he's a talented blogger as well thumbs up thumbs down your comments below please trolls don't let's not get too crazy here i know some of you guys are thrilled to death that finally you get to take shots at jeremy and say how much he sucks and he's going to be out of the league but let, let's go easy here i i don't i don't want to have to ban people because they're just spamming the comments and, and harassing uh jeremy lynn fans we don't. You don't have to agree. You don't have to be a fan, but just let's not go crazy. If your only purpose is to come in and try to convince everybody Jeremy sucks, I mean, nobody wants to deal with that. Um, we'll also include information in the video description along with Gary Chen's information for highlights of this game, how you can come and join the Conservative Media Facebook group, how you can come and follow us on Twitter also. Once again, I am PFV Paul F. Villarreal, the NBA expert. Thanks a lot for watching Conservative Media. Strive to be the number one Jeremy Lind YouTube fan channel. 
onwards we go. Let's go to Boston. The team's already there. If you're Jeremy Lin, forget about what happened in this game. It's good to have a short memory sometimes. Just get focused and ready to play tomorrow against Rajon Rondo and the Boston Celtics. If the team can win tomorrow, then they will have a 2-1 and one road trip, and they will have won four, or is that right, four? Three of their last four games. That's success. That's success. So hopefully we can we can get the victory tomorrow night, head back to L.A., and we'll just go from there. We'll see what happens. I know now there's talk that, well, Byron wants to make lineup changes, but he wants to have more practice time maybe first. So we'll see. First things first, though, which is let's try to get the victory in Boston. I don't know who's favored in that game. I would imagine Boston's probably favored because they're at home, but it's a, that's definitely a winnable game for the Lakers, and hopefully they will be able to get the victory indeed. Okay, that is it. I hope you're all having a great night or great day wherever you are around the world when you watch this video. Take care. We will talk to you again soon.